Hey everyone, how's it going today? My name is Zach Courier, and I have the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Ben, D ben Hunter today. How are you doing today, doctor? Yeah, doing well, Zach. Thanks for having me. Yep, thanks for joining us from Atlanta, Georgia. You're part of, you're the medical director at Skyland Trail for what, the last three years now? Yeah, about three years, and, and we are residential psychiatric uh, in the Brookhaven neighborhood of Atlanta, treating primarily 18 to 35 year olds, but we've actually recently opened a 14 to 17 year old adolescent unit, and we do treat all ages uh, um, past 35 as well, too. Awesome, that's great. Yeah, you were, obviously we were talking offline a little bit, telling me some of your story and sort of your background coming from sports and then getting into mental health. Can you tell us, uh, take us on a little bit of that ride there and how you ended up at Skyland Trail? Yeah, no, that's a, it, it's a, it was an interesting story. Definitely uh, not a direct path. Um, started out, uh, you know, really going into college thinking that professional baseball was going to be uh, my direction career-wise. Um, was playing in college, uh, had a fairly successful college career. Um, and throughout the course of, of playing in the college, playing in the Cape Cod League especially, and and some of the experiences you have during the summer that sort of mimic pro baseball, I uh, realized that I wasn't as satisfied with that as a career and sort of the um, the fulfillment wasn't there in the way that it was for some of the guys I knew who really enjoyed playing baseball professionally. And I had the opportunity to talk with lots of my former teammates who had played professionally. And just, I kind of realized that wasn't maybe where I wanted to head. Um, so kind of scrambled towards the uh, the end of college, always had the idea that medicine was something I would I would enjoy, um, and really at the time though it was surgery. Uh, surgery and plastic surgery in particular was was very intriguing to me. I think uh, a blend of artistry and and medicine in a way that uh, I found very appealing. Um, ended up uh, coming to Emory for medical school after undergrad and um, started down the plastics route, doing research and spending a lot of time practicing. You know, like most of the aspiring surgeons do. Um, was involved in the surgery interest groups and really didn't have mental health on the radar until probably third year in medical school. Um, and, you know, it was, it was funny. I met my mentor, uh, Ray Kotwicki, who's actually our chief medical officer here at Skyland Trail. Um, incredibly influential, well-spoken, just the epitome of what a physician was, was supposed to be and from everything we'd ever heard. He was extremely professional, again, cared about patients, but also maintained excellent boundaries and kind of just was a, was a consummate professional. And um, he took me aside at one point, knowing full well that my plan was to go into surgery and said, if you ever want to explore psychiatry as a career, or even just want to talk about careers in general, you know, get in touch with me and we'll, we'll talk. And he was involved in administrating the, the clerkships and sort of the medical education experience as a whole. So um, I knew he had a, a great perspective on, you know, a lot of med students in the past. And, you know, essentially around the third year of medical school, I, I realized that surgery also as a career might not fit with the lifestyle I desired, and, and also the way I wanted to help people, I think, as much as I thought it would initially. And I took him up on that offer. I, I met with Dr. Kotwicki and uh, actually ended up sharing a patient with him, a, a psychotherapy case that um, he had been working on for multiple years with a patient who was very interesting and a very demonstrative case in psychodynamic psychotherapy. And I was just taken with psychiatry at that point. I, I thought the concept of psychodynamic psychotherapy and, and the uh, sort of Countertransference and transference experience, and the way that's used as a tool to treat and, and evaluate, was just the most fascinating thing I'd, I'd ever seen. And, and it just totally fit with the way my mind worked and the way I'd always thought about interpersonal interactions. And I basically went into the plastic surgery offices the next day and said, You know, I'm, I'm not going to do this. I'm, I'm going to do psychiatry. Uh, it was so abrupt, Zach, that when match day came around and I matched in my residency program at, at University of Pennsylvania. I literally had people come to me and say, we thought you were joking. Like, we did not think this was actually a thing. Um, and, you know, at, at that time, I'd, I'd really seen a lot more of psychiatry. I'd done my sub-internships and things like that. I'd actually spent time at Skyland Trail as a sub-intern. And, um, again, I just found it to be incredibly fulfilling. Still loved operating. You know, I, I think surgery is an incredible field as well. But this was definitely my calling. And um, I've never looked back. And it's been a, a fantastic decision. I, I have to say there were a lot of people, including the surgeons who were very supportive at a time where I had uh, taken up quite a bit of their resources and mentorship as well. And, you know, I appreciate everything they did for me to help me get here as well. Yeah, if anything, just a, a more holistic view, right, that you probably garnered from that. Um, and, and it sounds like your friends were, were a little bit in jest there with like, we thought you were joking. But honestly, I mean, do you feel like there's a little bit of a stigma there um, to, to make that decision where, you know, there's some people being surprised and things like that. 
um, I, I, I interview a lot of psychiatrists that, that said they were at that crossroads between, you know, becoming a surgeon and, and having this, this type of lifestyle and this opportunity there. But uh, do you feel like there's still, you know, a, a stigma towards mental health and even going into that type of field? Yeah. And, you know, I, that's a great question, Zach. I, I think the, especially nowadays, I think we are getting, we're getting higher application rates into psychiatric residency programs, having more students who are interested. I think in the last maybe five or seven years in particular, you're just seeing a lot more about mental health and mental wellness in the, in the popular media. And, and, you know, you're hearing a lot of people come out with their stories about mental health issues and it's making it a lot more accessible, but particularly back then, I mean, mental health as a whole was stigmatized. And then also psychiatrists, partially, you know, partially out of our own sort of behavior and actions over the years. I've always been a little, you know, a little on the quirky side as a group, I would say. Um, it was seen as definitely a softer profession within medicine, I think, in a way that, you know, there, there wasn't quite as much evidence at many points in history about the, the treatments we use, the way we diagnose. You know, we don't have the same diagnostic testing that a cardiologist might have or a radiologist. And, you know, we have to make a lot of diagnoses based on data that's, again, harder to and objectively prove. And to me, this is actually the huge draw of psychiatry. I mean, this is something where, you know, your own personal skill and experience and your ability to use the evidence-based approaches and evidence-based assessment tools makes all the difference in the world in terms of your patient outcomes in most cases, along with just an ability to use yourself as a tool to treat, which I think is just the highest level of medicine. So for me, I mean, I, I luckily came from a place where um, reputation and, and self-esteem and things like that were, were something I wasn't struggling with. And I, I felt very confident going forward with a family that supported me, with friends who and, and colleagues in med school who supported me that this would be a great way to go. But um, there's no doubt that I think that it was something that was stigmatized too, again, even as a, a career within medicine. And I think that's shifting. Yeah, for sure. It, you know, maybe if there's a silver lining uh, to 2020, right? It's been a, a tough year for mental health and um, you know, even, even mental health professionals, you guys are on the front lines and, and some psychiatrists that I, I've spoken with are busier now than ever, really. Uh, what are you seeing right now? Here we are, you know, uh, towards the end of July 2020. What are you seeing in the community there and, uh, and, and, and perhaps correlating advice that you, got, you got, are giving out right now for the time? Yeah, and you know, what I'm seeing at this point, Zach, and I know, again, we're multiple months into this at the, you know, largely isolating and quarantining. And, and despite the fact that some places have reopened, we're still struggling to engage people in, in a lot of the activities they use to promote their own wellness, right? I mean, it's still not safe to go into a gym at this point. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not safe to be out in public in most scenarios in the same way that you would have been 10 months ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what I'm seeing primarily is exacerbations of the same things we were seeing before COVID and, and at the beginning of COVID. It's a lot of depression and anxiety. Um, the things that we do to take care of ourselves and prevent depression and anxiety in particular, um, along with other mental health issues, but I think just in, especially because of prevalence issues, those are the things we're seeing the most. It's, it's people who maybe had a grip on their mood and were, were doing a good job of managing their anxiety because they were able to exercise and socialize and, you know, work and be around coworkers and meaningful work, um, you know, to, to be out in, the, in, in public getting, you know, sunshine and fresh air and things like that. And they've just been, been limited in their ability to do that. And I think that's really challenged people's ability to stay well. Um, you know, the feelings of isolation that people are feeling, even when they're interacting, you know, via Zoom or, or FaceTime with friends, it's just not quite the same. And I, I mean, I say this partially as my whole career is dependent on being in a room with someone and the difference between feeling what it's like to, to experience them in person versus, you know, over Zoom or over a phone. Um, and obviously that's critical, but I mean, I do think there's a lot of people who have been surprised by how isolating that's been, even though they've been interacting with people on a regular basis via, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's telemedicine visits or just general calls with friends. Um, you know, the other thing too, I mean, you know, with a day to day that's starting to get a little bit monotonous for people and you're starting to lose the distinction between weekends and weekdays, I think scheduling and rhythm is something that's really falling off for a lot of people, which, you know, the first things you see are, you know, often mood disorders and, you know, we worry about bipolar disorder and other issues like that when sleep gets dysregulated in particular, um, rates of substance use, because I mean, we just got a lot of time to fill, right. And with depression and anxiety rising, the rates of self-medication often rise. So we see a lot of people who are, just, you know, consuming more alcohol or getting into more kind of vices in general, because they've got more time to fill and, and are, are feeling worn down by this at this point. So these are, these are really what we're dealing with. And, and, and that's 
kind of what we're trying to help people manage in a lot of cases. Um, to answer your question about, you know, what advice we're giving, and it's, it's largely, you know, again, it's, it's not to ignore what we're going through, right? I mean, even just the idea of working from home, right? I mean, as a concept, we talk about working from home, but in reality, we're all trying to work from home or people who are working from home are trying to work from home while also managing a crisis, right? I mean, in reality, this is not just working from home. This is not just the same as, you know, December of 2019. This is, this is a crisis through, that we are trying to work through as a society and as a, as a company in many cases, as businesses. Um, it, it's about maintaining some normalcy though. It's about recognizing that first fact, but also trying to set a schedule even on those days where you don't necessarily have a whole lot to do. It's trying to maintain some exercise and what you can do inside and outside, you know, without exposing yourself to the coronavirus risk. It's about, again, trying to connect with friends as much as you can and, and loved ones as much as you can to, you know, keep those strong bonds intact. And I, I think everything you can do to make this feel as normal as possible while also acknowledging this is an extremely abnormal situation is really the advice we're giving. Yeah, I think that's so important for sure. Yeah, you know, this sense of normalcy, as you referenced, I mean, it's just, it's hard to, to gauge. I mean, you think about where we were in March and where we are now and to look forward to November, what's life gonna be like, right? There's just so much that's sort of out of control so sort of focusing on what we can control. And as you mentioned, you know, things like things like getting some exercise and, and staying connected, I think is, is so important there. Uh, let's bring it back to Skyland Trail. Um, as the medical director there, what are some of the things that you guys are offering? Obviously, you're relatively new there compared to how long uh, that's really been a big piece of the community. So uh, what are some of the things that you guys are offering um, over there to help people right now? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and as you mentioned, Zach, and Skyline Trail has been around 30 plus years. It's really an institution in Atlanta and, and the Southeastern healthcare and national healthcare at this point from a residential standpoint. Um, we, have, we have offered our residential psychiatric program essentially throughout. We have really developed more of our um, step down day treatment and, and that's sort of partial hospitalization IOP type options as well. Um, as developing a, a TMS program in the last few years, um, I came in and, and part of the reason I uh, came in was to develop this, this transcranial magnetic stimulation treatment program. And um, we have really amped up our volume in terms of being able to access more people. I think the industry as a whole has started to accept TMS. I mean, the data is overwhelming. So at this point, it's not really a matter of whether it works, just how many people we can afford to give it to as, a, as an industry. And um, we, we've had a, a just incredible outcomes, I think, by combining management through our program. So we are offering TMS not only to our patients in-house, but also to... Uh, I'm sorry, doctor. I, uh, you cut out there for just a second. I'm not sure if there was a, uh, a something with the internet there, but right at combining. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you okay, can backtrack yeah. There. I apologize. Yeah, we'll, no, that's, that's fine. Yeah, we can, we can uh, chop that out real quick. But yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to miss that because it's important there. You're from combining... Yeah, so, so combining... Transcranial magnetic stimulation and, and really following the data into the newest treatment protocols, um, along with evidence-based psychotherapies. And we're doing cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, and other, again, evidence-based therapies for all of our patients in the program, along with evidence-based medication management choices. And we, we use evidence to drive everything we do here. Adjunctive therapies like art and horticulture, group therapy on a daily basis. I mean, this is the full spectrum of treatment from a mental health standpoint. And our outcomes are outstanding in the program in general, but when you add in TMS, I mean, it really takes it to the next level. And uh, yeah, I mean, our, our most recent data was somewhere around 80% um, response rate and 50% remission rate with TMS um, on a bilateral protocol. Uh, and I mean, again, that's, that's not uh, totally unheard of in, in some of the higher level treatment programs. I think, you know, you get a lot of the, uh, the um, academic centers who can, who can boast some pretty high numbers. I know we're getting great results from data burst and some other new technologies. But, um, you know, we really encourage people to, that, to think of it not just as TMS working, but as their dedication to their overall wellness and physical wellness included, to the psychotherapy and to continuing their medications as the reason why they're getting such outstanding results. I love that. Yeah, you mentioned overwhelming data. Now, you know, helping eight out of 10 patients significantly uh, you know, reduce some of those symptoms, as you, as you mentioned, you know, they're like the PHQ-9 scale, being able to see those completely invert, I think is so amazing. 
Now, what's not overwhelming is, is the popularity of TMS. There's just, it's still a well-kept secret, even though it's been what FDA approved since, what, 2008. Um, what are you guys doing to kind of spread the word about TMS or how, maybe more specifically, how do you break down what telecranial magnetic stimulation is for the lay person who is, who is depressed and this might be a great, great treatment resistant therapy for? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, as you mentioned, this has been FDA approved for, you know, 12 years now, right? And, and unfortunately, at this point, we're still hitting a relatively small percentage of the population. Part of it's financial. You know, we know that we know it's disproportionately effective for patients who have failed multiple medications. And in some ways, I think the insurance companies have used the data to mainly cover patients who have failed numerous trials. Um, I think we'd, we'd be in even better shape if we were able to get this into people's treatment regimen before they failed their fourth medication, which if you're doing it right, takes months and months of depression, right? And we know that every day that goes by without resolution tends to make it harder to treat. So, you know, my, my, my plug would be for the insurance industry to pick this up a little earlier. I have no doubt they will save money in the long run if they get people treated earlier, prevent hospitalizations, prevent, you know, lots of really expensive medication trials and things like that. But um, really for us, it's, you know, I, I do a lot of talks. I do um, a lot of kind of free webinars about TMS. I take every opportunity to try and speak publicly about it. Um, and also, you know, again, kind of thinking about reaching out to local providers. We, we have a number of providers in the area who refer us quite a few patients, especially when they see the results. Um, it's, it's easy. And then we start to open the floodgates. But a lot of times it's a matter of going to someone's office and saying, listen, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to run through your, your patient list with you and think about who's been really tough to treat and see if they might be a good candidate for TMS. Um, and again, you get a few people that get results after they've had no results with medications in some time. Uh, and it, you, you all of a sudden have somebody referring you, you know, a patient every week or two. So um, that's been great. I mean, especially because the patients just really benefit at such a disproportionate level from this therapy. And, um, you know, to explain to them too, I, I've actually had shockingly little difficulty <laughs> um, talking patients into this. It's kind of it. I was, I actually did a assessment earlier this morning and, and, you know, I was at a point where she just sort of looked at me and said, just, I want to do this. This is obviously something I want to do. You know, it's, it's not typically too difficult of a pitch because, the risks um, are so drastically outweighed by the potential benefits. And it's not that there's no risks, but I mean, in terms of uh, the psychiatric treatments we have available right now, I mean, this is, this is so weighted towards benefit that it, it's really tough to ignore. And, um, you know, I, I usually don't have a hard time even describing, you know, side effects to patients for them to feel like this is a great option, especially when they've been through so much usually suffering and, and um, you know, uh, time with unalleviated symptoms. So. That's amazing. I think that's that's really, really great. And I didn't want to gloss over what you said earlier. You mentioned someone like, if I remember it correctly, something like a cardiologist, right? You have all this battery of tests and stuff that you can employ. And it's a little bit different with psychiatry. Um, but I, I don't want it to come off or sound like that's pseudoscience, right? That uh, it's just medication managed, try this and come back, right? Um, you mentioned earlier what you guys are doing at Skyland Trail. It seems like there's a lot of different therapies and a lot of things that you guys are offering. Um, would it, you know, is, is it just maybe that it's based more in, in sort of listening to a per patient basis and, and where people, where you kind of direct people based on what therapies you're offering? I think so. Yeah. I mean, we, we have a very comprehensive assessment process here for patients who enter our residential program and, and our intensive services program as a whole. Um, we really think through what, what therapies are most indicated, right? I mean, one of the things we see, you know, broadly, you know, I don't want to say misused, but maybe overutilized is dialectical behavioral therapy, which is a treatment for borderline personality disorder or people with, you know, significant borderline personality symptoms that may end up turning into a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder you know, that, that is something that is not necessarily evidence-based just for depression or for other sorts of issues that come up. And, you know, in, in many cases, you see patients who have said, I've done DBT, and, and you say, well, you know, CBT is certainly evidence-based for you, but I'm not sure that, and not to totally distinguish between the two, but, you know, regular CBT would be highly evidence-based intervention for you, and you've only been in DBT for the last couple of years. Let's, let's get you into some cognitive behavioral therapy proper, and if we end up seeing significant borderline personality pathology, we'll certainly direct you towards our, our DBT program, too, and you know, again, it certainly helps that you have some skills built, but, you know, between that and between actually using the data and using treatment algorithms, the way they're designed to be used, I mean, we, we don't have an absolute absence of evidence in, in psychiatry. It's just, I think, partially because the, the group of physicians that self-select for psychiatry also tend to be very interested in narrative, in human experience, in, again, the feeling of being in the room with a patient and using some of their observations and interactions to diagnose and treat. 
and that shouldn't preclude us from using data. I mean, I, I just, I think that only supports these conversations we're having. And um, I, I know that patients feel more comfortable when you tell them the reasons why you're choosing certain treatment options and what the data is and what they can expect. And they feel like there's direction and they feel like there's a course they can follow. And, you know, in many cases, especially when treatment resistant patients have come through, like they often do for TMS or even in a residential program as a whole, uh, it just feels directionless. And, and we want to reset that sense of, of North South. And, um, you know, we are, we are dedicated to evidence-based medicine, even in a field that's relatively, again, kind of on the softer side, the more, the more um, human experience oriented side. Um, I, I don't see why this should be any different than doing a, an EKG or a, a CT scan. And, and, you know, quite frankly, when we do things like TMS that are very sort of biologically oriented as we think about them, we have excellent studies that show that the actual brain, you know, physiology and morphology changes are profound, right? This is not something that, you know, is placebo based. It's, it, you know, certainly prone to having people believe in it, given that it's a fairly drastic intervention. But I think at the end of the day, we have hard biological evidence to support these treatments. And, you know, we want to make sure patients understand that's what we're doing too, because that's important to them and their, you know, thoughts about prognosis and their, their future treatment. Well, as you said earlier, you know, not, not too tough a sell when people get a chance to talk to you about TMS or any of the other uh, therapies that you guys are offering. So I think you're doing an amazing job out there, doctor. Um, I, you know, we really appreciate the work that you're doing in the Atlanta area. Um, it, was, it was definitely a joy to have you on today and be able to speak to the community. So we really appreciate that. Any uh, last thoughts that you'd like to leave us with today? Yeah, no, just really appreciate you having me on, Zach. I think any chance we have to talk about TMS and about, you know, psychiatry and psychiatric treatment as a whole um, is, is a great opportunity to take. And, you know, I think the one thing I'd add to what I said earlier about, you know, what to say to people who are struggling right now is that this is prime time to, to get in with a therapist or to, to get into psychiatric treatment if you're struggling. Um, you know, telehealth has made this widely available, even in situations where it may not have been previously. And uh, you know, I really commend um, the organizations that have helped support telehealth um, kind of uh, restriction release for this period in particular. I mean, this has made it accessible to so many people. So, you know, if, you, if you're thinking about seeing a psychiatrist or seeing a therapist, you know, see a psychiatrist or a therapist. It, it's something that very few people will end up regretting. I love that. That's amazing. Well, thank you. Thank you for putting it in such great terms for us today. Keep up the good work. And uh, yeah, we wish you the best of luck throughout the rest of this crazy year. So. Thanks, Zach. Awesome. Take care.